All right. Well, it's great to see you guys this morning. I'm hoping it's going to be a nice, beautiful day. This is why you live in Southern California, right? It's the beautiful weather and starts off a little chilly and then gets just that right temperature towards the, the middle of the day. And as we get ready for Easter, it's just a great reminder of spring is here and new life. And of course, the new life that we have in Jesus. And let me just encourage you over the next couple of weeks, folks are just a little more receptive when you you invite them to come to church or when you share the gospel with them, uh, take advantage of the next couple of weeks. Just invite friends or family, invite your coworkers just to come to church and, and hear the gospel and, and pray for them. Don't just invite them, but be praying for them that, that they may hear the gospel and, and, and it would be clear and that they would respond. It'd be great to kind of see, uh, as you guys are going to notice, I don't know if for new people, uh, I won't make you raise your hand. I'll just say this. Uh, if you're new here, if you walk around our campus, springtime's a great time to do that. You're going to see all these roses that are in bloom, all these white roses that are out in the courtyard and around the campus. Uh, each one of those rose bushes represents a person who is trusted in Jesus, right? And, and so we planted those throughout the years for folks to do that. And what would be awesome is after this Easter to see that the campus so full of roses that we don't even have room to, to do other things, right? Wouldn't that be awesome? So be inviting, be taught, praying for them them, uh, share the gospel, do all those kind of things, and, and let's just trust God and see what he does uh, this, this Easter. Uh, by the way, my name is Matt Dumas. Today we are going to continue in the book of Hebrews. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, and for those who are, the book of Hebrews is written by a guy named Paul. And Paul writes to some Jewish believers who are suffering persecution for their faith. Uh, they've, they've trusted in Jesus as their Messiah. Uh, they're excited about it, but all of a sudden it's not so exciting when all their friends and families begin to persecute them. And so Paul writes to encourage them not to give up and not to give in, even in the midst of persecution, but to hold firm to their faith, knowing that Jesus is greater. Is this, this is on, right? Can y'all, y'all can hear me? Okay. Uh, for some reason, I don't feel as loud as I normally do, but I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> All right. I'm tempted to go louder, but I won't right now. So, uh, and Jesus is greater, right? Uh, as Paul has said, as he opens up the, this awesome book, he says that he is greater as the son of God. And when we say that, uh, and, and two, this is what I want you to know. When you're telling your friends about Jesus, I said this last week, you're not just talking about a nice guy who had some nice things to say, right? You're talking about the one who is the son of God. Paul says he's the radiance of the father's glory. He's the exact representation of his nature, He's very God, a very God. And if you don't get that piece of it, he's the one who created everything. And by his power, he upholds all things. That's the guy you're talking about. He's the one who's worshipped by the angels. And not only is he the son of God, but he's the son of David. He's the promised king who would come. He's the heir of all things. What does that mean? He gets it all. He's king over all. He's not only our savior and our redeemer, he's the perfect sacrifice and the perfect high priest. He defeated death and the devil. And he's our resurrected king. And so I hope that gets you excited. That when you tell somebody about Jesus, you're not just talking about some guy. It was really nice. He it, it lived a long time ago. And man, if you just follow his ways, you're going to be happy in life. You're talking about the son of God. And you're talking about the king. And so last week, Paul said that Jesus, once again, on this train that he's been on, that Jesus is greater. He, he talks about this priesthood that he has, that it is a greater priesthood. And Jesus, as the greater high priest, he doesn't have to offer a sacrifice for himself, but he offers himself as the sacrifice. Once for all, for the sins of all the people. And that he is able to save forever those who trust in him. 
because he is always interceding for us before the Father. And because of Jesus now, we too can draw near to God. And so today, uh, Paul's going to talk about Jesus having a greater ministry based on a greater covenant. Please turn to Hebrews chapter 8 and let's pray. Father, we thank you for today and for just the opportunity to spend time in your word. Lord, we don't want to take for granted that we have such a privilege that in our own language we can read your words and that your words are the thing that give us life. And Lord, I pray that as we spend time in your word today, I pray that as we uh, look into this passage, Lord, that you would give us understanding, that your spirit would have freedom to move, to challenge us. Lord, that we would see even more clearly Jesus in all his glory. And Lord, I pray as we get ready for Easter, Lord, I pray that you would first of all uh, turn our hearts to you. Help us in these coming weeks, Lord, to, to, to remember, to think on, Lord, to, to be blown away all over again about what Jesus has done for us. And Lord, I pray that that would just overflow into the conversations that we have in the coming weeks. I pray that we would be the aroma of Christ wherever we go, that, Lord, the things that we say and the things that we do would bring honor and glory to your name. And that folks would know we worship a risen Savior who is the King of Kings. And Lord, I pray that you would bring lots of folks here who don't know you. And that, Lord, they would hear the gospel and that they would believe. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take a look at verse 1. Now, the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, so it is necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle. For see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. So Paul starts off. Now the main point in what has been said, right? So all that he's been talking up till now, he says, here's the main point. If you missed it all that I've talked about, he said, here's it. Here it is. Are you ready? This is yes. This is no. Are you ready? We have such a high priest. Now, what is he talking about? Well, he says, one who's, set, who's seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. He, he's taking us back to Hebrews chapter 1. Remember in Hebrews chapter 1, he talked about this one who sits there, who sits next to the majesty on high, the, uh, referencing Psalm 110. That's been one of Paul's favorite passages in this book, is Psalm 110. This promise, not only that Jesus would be a son who would be king, but he would be appointed as priest. And so he would be a king priest, unlike anyone else besides this guy named Melchizedek. And it's his priestly function that has been highlighted. He says, taking his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. That's a pretty significant statement. You know, we've talked about this before when they, instructions for putting together the tabernacle. Same thing in the temple. You know, one piece of furniture that's missing in there. 
You got a table of showbread. You got the candelabra. You've got the Ark of the Covenant. You got this screen that's there. You, you've got the, the big kind of thing where the, the bulls are underneath it, the, where they wash their hands. You've got all the tools and stuff. You know what's missing from the tabernacle? Where's the chair? Where's the chair that the priest is supposed to sit in? There's no chair. But this priest has sat down. What does that signify? You see, the priests in the Old Testament couldn't sit down because their job was never done. There was always more oil to put into the lamps. There was always another sacrifice to offer. There was always bread to be changed out. There was always something to do. But see, this high priest, the one who on the cross, as he hung there, said, it is finished, has completed the work. Right, All the sacrifices pointed to his one once-for-all sacrifice for sin. He finished it. And because that work is done, the work of, uh, of reconciling, the work of atoning, the work of, ta- work of taking away sins, because it is done, he can say it is finished and he can sit down. But... Well, all that's true. There's also a work that he continues even as he sits at the right hand of the Father. And that's the work of intercession. That's the work that he does on our behalf, continually offering up, making intercession for us. I've said this before. Anybody ever mess up? Since the time you trusted in Jesus, have you ever made a mistake? Ever, anybody ever sinned? How about this morning? How about in the last five minutes? And yet Jesus is always interceding. He's always coming before the Father. He's always pleading our case before him based on his own shed blood. Jesus is always there, always doing the work of intercession. And he's ministering in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle. Where do you think that is? Hint. In heaven, right? How do we know? It's because it's not made by human hands. It's made, it's the, the tent that the Lord pitched, not man. The main job of a high priest, according to the Levitical system, was to offer up the gifts and the sacrifices of the people. So you guys would all bring your, your stuff to the high priest and the pri- priest would offer it up for you. That was kind of the the thing. So that you bring it, he offers it. You bring it, he offers it. That's what sacrifices, when and by whom kind of stuff. All the things that are outlined in the law or in the Torah. So Jesus is going to be a high priest. Paul makes this point. He too has to have something to offer. That's what a high priest does. He makes intercession. He has to have something to offer. So what will this priest offer? himself. He will offer the perfect sacrifice because he will offer himself. And he is a high priest, but a very different kind than the Levitical priests. The others served a copy and a shadow of the heavenly. Right? When Moses, Exodus 25, if, if you're reading through your Bible and you get to the, this place in Exodus, most of Exodus, the latter part, is the building of the tabernacle. And in chapter 25, as they're kind of getting ready to go, uh, Moses has gone up on the mountain. And, and God shows him. A, a, a blueprint, right? A map. He, he shows him what the, the t- tabernacle is supposed to look like. And so he says, make sure that you make everything according to what you saw up on the mountain. So what does that mean? That the thing that's on earth is a copy of what's in heaven. It's not the real thing. It's a copy of the real thing. It's a model based on what he saw. 
I was thinking about this. Um, anybody ever been on like a pretty amazing vacation? Let's say only a couple of y'all, I'm sorry. <laughs> like you've seen something like, let's say the Grand Canyon. Anybody ever been to the Grand Canyon? Okay, did you take a picture of it? Did you show people and say, man, this was really awesome. Let me show you a picture of the Grand Canyon. And you go, look at this. And they go, okay. <laughs> but when you stand with your toes kind of hanging over the edge of that thing, and you look at this big giant hole in the earth, you're like, wow. I think you said it, Dave. Is that real? I mean, that's the thing you think. Anytime I've seen something magnificent like that, I take a picture, I bring it back, and I go, hey, look at it, how awesome my vacation was. And they go, uh, yeah, it's just a statue of some naked guy named David. <laughs> no, man, if you were there, it's really awesome. I don't know why I used that example. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we can strike that one from the tape. <laughs> okay, where was I? <laughs> that's what happens when you go off script so <laughs> let me go back um copy and shadow okay so 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 the copy and the shadow is not the substance and so his whole point is the levitical priests they serve in this copy right they they're the picture you're seeing the picture but jesus serves in the heavenly He's the substance, the real thing. He's your hanging your toes off the edge of the Grand Canyon kind of experience. And so that's Paul's point is you have the copies versus the real thing. And Jesus has a better, a more excellent ministry, he says. He's the mediator of a better covenant that's based on or enacted on better promises. And so what's the better covenant that's on, enacted on better promises? Well, that's what he goes into next. So look at verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. For finding fault with them, he says, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I'll effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people." And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me, from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. When he said, A new covenant, he has made the first obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear." So he says, for what if, for if that first covenant had been faultless? Now, what's the first covenant he's talking about? And that would be the Mosaic covenant. That's the, 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 the law, the Torah. That's the first five books of the Bible. That's what undergirds this Levitical priesthood that he's been talking about. It's that, that first covenant. The thing that talks about what is sacrificed, when and by whom. So when, what does Paul mean by faultless, is he saying that the fault was, worth, was with the first covenant? And the answer is no. He's not saying that the first covenant had fault in it. Remember that the covenant reveals the character of God. Right? The law reveals God's character. That's why uh, David can talk about it in Psalm uh, 1, Psalm 19, Psalm 119, the longest book of the Bible. He can talk about the beauty and the wonder and the majesty of the law of Torah. Because it does, it brings life and understanding and all of those things. The problem isn't Torah. It's this right here. The problem is our hearts. That's the problem. It's not a Torah problem. It's a heart problem. 
right? So the fault wasn't with the law. It wasn't with Torah. It was with the folks that were unfaithful. And that's highlighted when he says, for finding fault with them. And so there was a need for a second covenant, a new covenant to come along. And then Paul quotes from Jeremiah 31. This is in 31 to 34. Now, Jeremiah is a prophet whose ministry spans the last three kings of Judah. So he's there right when the Babylonians are starting to come in. And he's going to minister till the walls fall. And he's kind of left with this little band of folks that are still there. Jeremiah, as he begins his prophecy, he's going to talk about, um, he's going to warn the, the folks in Jerusalem of impending doom. Right? That the Babylonians are coming because of your apostasy, because of your unfaithfulness, because you've turned away from the Lord your God and you haven't followed him. All hell is going to break loose in this place. We probably should hear that more often. It's about to get real. And so you guys need to get ready. You see, God is faithful even when we're unfaithful. And in the covenant, he said that if you are faithless, if you turn away, if you disobey me, then I will discipline you. And the greatest of the disciplines would be exile from the nation. You would go into exile to another land. And so Jeremiah's going, guys, it's time. You're about to go into exile. And so that, that happens in the first half of Jeremiah is all these warnings about impending doom. And then boom, the city falls. Babylonians come in. Temple's gone. Second half of Jeremiah, though, is like most of the prophets. After this uh, proclaiming this coming doom, the judgment that was going to be there, then there's this promise of restoration. There's this promise of forgiveness and mercy. There's a, a promise of the kingdom. That God hasn't forgotten Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He hasn't forgotten the promises he made to the forefathers. He will fulfill what he has said. Even though the people had been faithless. And that's where we find this new covenant. This is where we find the passage that he's talking about. A new covenant, which implies at least something different than what was before. And one difference, and this is easy to overlook. He says that this new covenant is one that God will effect. That's a kind of a strange word to use. But it means to finish or accomplish. A second covenant is one that God will, God will finish. He will accomplish. A covenant is kind of like an agreement. And when you have an agreement, there's usually two parties to the agreement, right? And each person has obligations, right? If I do this, you do that. If I do this and you don't do that, then we've broken the covenant. That's, that's the Mosaic covenant. God did his part. They didn't do their part. But now he says, I'm going to accomplish, I'm going to complete this covenant. Which means God says, I will do it. What's my responsibility then? In this covenant, God's the one who's obligated himself to do what he's going to do. You see, he made a covenant with Israel. Now he's going to effect a new covenant with them, right? So the, the, even the groundwork changes in how he's going to do this. This is going to be all of God. He says this covenant is with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. What does that mean? Exactly what it says. The house of Israel and the house of Judah. Who are those folks? Jews, yeah, Jews. So if you're not a Jew, guess what? This doesn't, this isn't your covenant. Wow, that's kind of shocking. What do you mean? This is not a covenant that's made with us as Gentiles. Who is it made with? 
the house of Israel, and the house of Judah. So if you're not from the house of Israel or the house of Judah, this is a Jewish covenant, just like all the covenants. You see, it's through Abraham that all the families of the earth will be blessed. So we're going to get the benefits of this covenant for sure. But we can't claim that the new covenant is a covenant with us because it's not. It's with his people. So why do we care about the Jews? Why do we care that they come to faith and that they uh, accept Jesus as their Messiah? Because they're the root and we've been grafted in. And if they don't make it, you ain't going to make it. We only make it if they make it. So it's super important that we remember that this is a covenant he makes with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And notice it's both Israel and Judah, which means the band's back together. The country is at one. The first covenant was broken almost as soon as it was made, right? Remember the example that's carried through this whole time has been this, this wilderness generation, this exodus generation, that as soon as they come out of, uh, out of Egypt, pass through the Red Sea, they go, they get the law, yay! Get to the land, refuse to go in, spend 40 years walking around. So when it says that God didn't care for them, when they rejected, they refused to go in. If you read Deuteronomy 1, it says that God didn't listen to them, right? Once they tried to go in, uh, once they, they refused to go in, they back up. God says, you got 40 years in the wilderness. They go, oh, no, 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 we're going to go in. As soon as they start to go in, guess what happens? Wiped out, right? All the, the, the guys come in that they thought were too big end up being too big. Because God's not with them. And he doesn't listen to them as they start whining and complaining. So that's where it says, I did not care for them. The 40 years of discipline in the wilderness. Here's the difference, the main difference between the old and the new. The old covenant was written at least partially on tablets of stone, right? Remember the coming down from the mountain, two, two big rocks in his hand? It was external, right? The new covenant will put the Torah where? Minds and on the heart. Remember, the problem was not a Torah problem. So it's not as if he's going to go, you know what, let's, let's kind of start over, throw away the Torah, and do something totally different. He's going to say, no, what we're going to do is we're going to take the Torah, and we're going to put it on your heart, because your heart is the problem. Not my law. It's your heart. And so he's going to fix that by putting Torah on our minds and our hearts. The new covenant reaffirms that the house of Israel and the house of Judah are the people of God. He says, I will be their God and they will be my people. That's the, mar that's the language of marriage. It's covenantal language. And then he says something that seems universal, at least for his people, knowledge of the Lord. He said, no one will need to teach anyone any longer their neighbor or their brother know the Lord for all will know me. What does all mean? From the least to the greatest. So who's missing from that group? So if missing it with all, then he picks it up with least to the greatest, right? And, and so there's this seeming a uh, universal, at least for the people of God, for the Jewish people, this knowledge when does that happen? Well, let's see. It started at the Last Supper, right? When Jesus was having a meal with who? 11 Jewish guys that represented the nation of Israel. When will it be completed? I don't know. Sometime in the future. When the nation is, gra when, they, when they accept their Messiah. And they welcome him back and they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, according to Zechariah. Here's another difference between the old and the new. The old covenant made provision for sacrifices that would only cover sin for a time. 
right? So the day of atonement, every year, you're going to offer a sacrifice on the day of atonement. This new covenant uh, provides for the forgiveness of sins completely because of one sacrifice that's made. And when the Lord, through Jeremiah, says a new covenant, it makes the current covenant, the first covenant, old. And he says, what is becoming old is near disappearing. What does that mean? Well, it means at least this, the way that we relate to God is different. Uh, It's no longer based on a sacrificial system. We no longer bring sacrifices uh, on a daily basis and an annual basis for the forgiveness of sins. We have the once for all sacrifice. We have a different priest and a different priesthood. We know at least that's different. It also means that we've been given a new heart and one that wants to please the Lord, right? Right? That old heart's been, a new heart's been put in. And his spirit now dwells within us. So as the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises, Jesus then, the whole point is, he, he has a more excellent ministry. And we get to be the beneficiaries of his ministry. No longer do we have to rely on copies and shadows because we have the real thing. Right? Praise the Lord, we have the real thing. Our feet can hang off the edge because we have Jesus. And we may not fully understand, I said this last week, we may not fully understand everything that Paul's talking about. That's okay. It doesn't make it any less spectacular because Jesus is still the perfect high priest and the perfect sacrifice. Jesus still saves completely and forever. Jesus still makes intercession for us. Even if we don't understand how all that works, he still does it on our behalf. And because of him, we can still draw near to God. Even if we don't understand everything that Paul's saying, we can still do that. If you've trusted in Jesus. And if you haven't, then today would be a great day to trust in him. You see, because all that Paul has said about him is absolutely true, right? And if you want to follow him, it's simple as this. It's admitting that you're a sinner in need of a savior, which is every one of us. It's believing that Jesus is everything that Paul has said. He's the savior that God promised would come. He lived that perfect life. He died a sacrificial death. He became the once for all sacrifice for sins. He was raised the third day. And now he sits at the right hand of the father. And by believing in him, you can have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Right? That you too can draw near to God. And if you want to talk about that, I'll be at the front after the service. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for today and for just the opportunity once again to be reminded how how great Jesus is and all that he has accomplished for us. Lord, that we can have true forgiveness of sins, that we can have eternal life, that, Lord, we can draw near to you in ways that in the Old Testament they were just weren't available because of his once for all sacrifice. And I pray, Father, that that would create in us a desire to worship you, a desire to to proclaim your name and to make you famous. We thank you for Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.